So a while back, I made a video about counting and how counting can be one of the keys to improving your rhythm. I got a lot of questions on that video. And so in this video, we are going to dive into some of these obscure questions about counting. So buckle up, get ready, here we go. Should I still count quarter notes when playing quarter note triplets, like a polyrhythm? What I would recommend starting with is counting the subdivision that will fill in all of the notes that you're going to hit, meaning count eighth note triplets to begin, which will sound like one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four and, uh, and then if you play quarter note triplets against that, it'll sound like this. One and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four and uh, one. In your head, you're filling in all of the subdivisions. And so there's no guesswork as to where those second and third notes of the quarter note triplets should land. Now, once you're comfortable subdividing, you can then take away the inner triplet subdivisions and just count quarter notes. So it would sound like one, two, three, four, one. But in your head, you should still be feeling and almost counting mentally one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, four and uh, one and uh, two, three, four if you want to have the most precision when you're playing this rhythm. Awesome video, Sean. How would you recommend translating counting practice for musicians who can't use their voices while they play? So I got a lot of questions about this from people who play wind instruments or people who sing, or also from people who play violin, which is something I completely didn't think about. Uh, or even no, I didn't realize that you can't use your mouth while you're playing violin, but I guess you would drop it or something bad would happen. So what do you do if you play one of these instruments? The thing to keep in mind is that the counting is not the end goal itself. It's a means to an end. It allows you to prepare for imagining a metronome in your head, which is what I argue in my original video is the ultimate goal. So if your goal is to be able to hear your own metronome in your head, to literally imagine the sound of it, and to play along to that, then you don't necessarily need to count to get there, but you do need some way of internalizing that rhythm. I know a handful of vocalists that use their body to keep track of time. So it might be hand movements or their arms or other gestures that allow them to know where the beat is. And I've found that they have a really, really strong sense of time when they sing, meaning they're not just floating over the time and not really lining up with things, but they are really very aware of where the beat is and how that relates to what they're singing. So that might be another approach. You could also tap your foot, which I think could work, but I'm a little bit hesitant to recommend that fully because if you're not keeping good time with your foot, that can be really problematic if that's your source of time. So it's something you might have to practice a little. That's the advantage of the voice is that we already have extreme precise control over the timing and the way that we use our voice because we're so used to speaking and that requires a lot of timing in, in and of itself. So I think that using your voice is definitely the best case scenario, but if you can't use your voice, try some sort of body movement like tapping your foot or snapping your fingers. And if all else fails, just practice with a metronome. I tend to count the exact rhythms I play. One and two and a three and four and a. What's your opinion on that? Is it not developing my internal clock as well as if I count it consistently? If consistency is what you're looking for in your timing, then it does pay off to count consistently the same thing, especially if everything you're playing will line up on the same grid. For example, if you're playing in four, four, nothing fancy, and the only subdivisions you're using are quarter notes, eighth notes, and 16th notes. You could count any of those subdivisions and whatever you're playing will line up with that. And so if you wanna develop consistent time, and especially if you're say a drummer, for example, and you wanna practice switching between a groove and a fill and not messing up the time, then I think counting the same thing consistently while you're playing all this different stuff is a really great way to train that consistency. Now, the one place that I would say you should change your counting is when the subdivision changes. So if you go into something that's based on triplets out of this 4-4 that we've been in, then you probably wanna change your voice because counting 16th notes while you're playing eighth note triplets is not really gonna be helpful for anybody. So I think in that case, yeah, when the subdivision changes, change what you're counting. One place where this really helped me was when I was learning the black page. And this has subdivisions sometimes changing multiple times per measure, maybe three or four times, and you've got all these weird subdivisions and tuplets that are very big numbers and strange foreign rhythms. And in that case, 
I absolutely had to change what my voice was doing to match those. So I would say in general, yeah, I like to aim for counting consistently, counting the same thing, but there's definitely situations where it does help to change. Should I count out loud when I practice improvisation? Seems brain right? Um, no, not necessarily. I don't think you have to count over everything. I mean, I love counting and love it more than most people and perhaps love it a little bit too much, but you don't necessarily want to be counting when you're practicing improvisation or practicing something that requires a lot of concentration. I'm sure it wouldn't hurt you in that you'd probably end up having a really great time, but if it's something that really demands all of your attention, like improvising, then by all means, forget about counting and just play. I'm interested in how this can be used to help with timekeeping of unquantized beats. How would you count straight and practice placing the beats ahead or behind? Or would you count unquantized and link your rhythms up to that count? If the answer is the first, which I'm feeling it would be, how do you go about making sure you're out by the same amount every time? Great video, thanks. First, we have to look at different kinds of unquantized beats. And there are those unquantized sounding beats that are actually quantized, and then there are those that are not. So for the ones that are quantized, for example, many of Sungazer's songs have this sort of drunk, unquantized feel, but they are in fact on a grid. It's just that the grid that they're on is not one that we're used to hearing most of the time. It's going to be maybe fives or sevens or nines or something like that. And so in that case, if you're doing that kind of thing, then you just count it out and everything's quantized anyway. So you use the same approach as you would normally use. If we're talking about this other realm where things are truly off the grid, then this question gets a little trickier. And the first question I probably ask yourself is, do I need to count this thing? And there are cases where it doesn't make sense to count and where you really just have to feel it. I sometimes make fun of these people that just say, just feel it, man, because it's sort of an excuse in my eyes in many cases for not doing the work. Like, you either have it or you don't. And if you don't, then just you suck and forget about it. And I, first of all, think that's a really harmful attitude to have. And second of all, it's not actually helpful to the student. So in many cases, you do have to sit down and deliberately practice something. And so often when people say, just feel it, that can be an indication that they actually don't know the answer to the question, which is okay. And it doesn't mean that they can't play. They can play beautifully and not know how they're doing it. Um, but anyway, I'm usually a little bit skeptical about that answer of just feel it, man. But there are situations where that is the right thing to do. And this unquantized thing might be one of those situations where you really have to just use an intuitive sense, which is trained over many hours of practice and experience, that's a very powerful process and not something that we should ignore. And in recent years, I've come to really appreciate just how powerful our subconscious is. So you still have to sit down and do the work often consciously, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes as far as, you know, like when you learn a language and you pick up your mother tongue as an infant and you pick up the subtleties of the, the accent and everything to a point where it becomes very hard to even break that later in life, you're picking up all those kinds of details in music as well. And you're noticing like where things sound good, like what part of the stick do I have to touch to the rye bell to get a clear quality sound? And a lot of that happens subconsciously. And I think that can happen with timing too. I would say that the voice has a specific role to play. And that role is to train your mental metronome or your internal time. And so you should practice using your voice in the way that you want your internal time to sound and to feel. So for example, if you count totally staccato, one and two and three and four and as opposed to one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and with a little bit of a swing. That makes a difference in the way that you play. And this reinforces the idea that the way that you count has an effect on the way that you feel and the way that you play. And so you should count in the way that you want to feel and the way that you want to play. And one last example for this is another way that you can play these unquantized or laid back or pushed ahead beats is by counting consistent time and then playing like literally behind the beat. Meaning you might play one, two, three, four, where the two and four are literally displaced by some amount of time. And it might be a 30 second note. It might be 
a 64th note and it doesn't matter necessarily what it is. It's more like a flam, like you're saying the number two and then your hit comes right after that. And that could be another way that you can approach this. So I hope that gives you a couple avenues to try. It's gonna depend a lot on the situation and it might not be appropriate to count at all. I find it so hard to count at the same time as playing. I lose count so easily or I stop concentrating on what I'm playing. I've always just thought of it as a cognitive weakness of mine that I just can't get past, but as a result, my timekeeping is awful. Any tips on how to concentrate on both at the same time? You say a couple times that your voice is free when you're not using it, but I feel it isn't free. Like I don't have enough attention to attend to both tasks. You're definitely not alone in thinking that this is difficult. Anytime I sit down to count something new that I've never counted or perhaps to play something that I've never counted over, I have to struggle and mess it up in the beginning and it just takes a lot of time. So you need to work on things very slowly and you need to count not necessarily over the most difficult thing that you can play. So you might want to start out by counting over simpler things and building up very, very slowly and gradually. And if there's something that you really, really want to or have to count over, say you are learning something that's very difficult, then you need to slow the tempo way down. And oftentimes I will slow things down to 50% tempo. There's practically no situation where you wouldn't benefit from slowing things down and getting it nice and perfect and clean. It does just take time and you have to really start slowly. Does beatboxing while playing guitar count? When you're beatboxing, you're just making noises with your mouth, which is exactly what you're doing when you're speaking anyway. So I don't see any reason that wouldn't work. In theory, it shouldn't matter what syllable you're saying or what sound you're making. So yeah, that would probably work just as well. My inner clock sounds to me like a muffled bass drum in a way, but I guess the goal is to have it as clear as a hi-hat click. Am I right? I do think there's benefits to having it be a sharp, clear sound because that tells you really precisely where the time is. Personally, when I do this, I am either imagining the sound of the metronome that I use all the time, which is usually an app. I use the Tempo Advance app on all of my devices. It's the best metronome I've ever used. So whatever metronome that you're used to hearing or have heard the most is probably your best bet as far as what to imagine. Another thing that I do sometimes is I'll imagine a voice, usually my own voice, me counting. So I know what my voice sounds like when I'm counting and I might mentally count out loud if I've got to keep track of say a time signature or how many measures I've played. I'll actually imagine the sound of my own voice saying those numbers, and that can be equally as effective. I might imagine the sound of another musician, like perhaps another drummer whose feel I want to emulate for a particular song, like let's say John Bonham. And if I imagine the way that he plays and that kind of half swung thing that he's got, I can imagine him playing and me playing maybe double drums with him in the same room, and I want to really lock in with him. And that can work. These are like weird, sort of bizarre sounding exercises, but they do have some results. And so in theory, you can use any sound you want. It depends on what kind of sound you're going for. Depending on the situation and the kind of time feel you want, you might change uh, the sound settings, for lack of a better term, in your head to reflect what it is that you want to hear and feel. Counting frustrates me because everything becomes so much harder to play. Any way to combat this other than just sticking with it, which is obviously the biggest thing, I guess. As I said before, this is not easy and it's sometimes not fun, but it is also sometimes the thing that you really have to do to break through to the next stage. So I think that, yeah, sticking with it is a big part of it. And I would also keep in mind that if it gets really difficult, then this is actually a great opportunity to slow things down. So I would embrace the difficulty, slow it down as much as humanly possible until you can really get it and do it solidly. And then you'll be amazed at how much better you're gonna be able to play fast from having practiced it slow. Anyone else having a really hard time with stamina when doing this? It's really shocking just how much air saying stuff takes out of your lungs. Yeah, this is a very real problem that you run into if you're counting because we all have to breathe out and we all have to breathe in. And so the solution to this is to learn how to count while breathing in. Just count normally as long as you can. And then when you run out of breath, just breathe in as you count. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and five. Two and four and one and two and... I know it's a little weird, but you gotta do it, so you gotta do it. I play both jazz and classical bass and see this method is really helpful for me improving my jazz time. But as for the micro retardandos that accompany some solo classical repertoire, such as Bach, would you still recommend this method? And if so, would you make any accommodations or think about things any different? So for music that speeds up and slows down a lot and where that's part of the feel of the music, you don't necessarily have to count. And I think you already had that figured out here. 
Um, if you do want to count, I don't think there's any harm in slowing down your counting. If you have a retardado and you're playing one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. I don't think you have to count, but if you do, remember that the way that you use your voice is ultimately the way that you want to hear the music in your head. So your voice should reflect that feeling. So if the music speeds up or slows down, your voice should speed up and slow down as well. I'd like to see if using this could help lock in my bass guitar rhythm. I'm pretty sure it will. Yeah, this is a great exercise that works not only for drummers, but for guitarists, bassists, pretty much anybody that's not using their voice to play their instrument. And I've spoken to many musician friends over the years. I've spoken a lot to Adam Neely about this and he's said that it helped him a lot improve his time. So yeah, it can definitely help you out as a basis. And last question here, should we practice this with or without a metronome? Just to clarify, thanks. I would definitely say practice with a metronome most of the time because you wanna have that objective source of time so that you have something to compare to. And then when you go into a situation where you don't have a metronome, you'll be much more likely to have had developed good habits from that. Now, you also have to practice keeping good time without a metronome. And a good way to do that is to just play and record yourself and try and keep good time. And then you're gonna notice in the recording whether you sped up or slowed down or whatever. But yeah, definitely in general, the more you practice with a metronome, the better if you're trying to go for that super spot on, accurate, consistent feel. And that's it for this video. So I hope this gave you some new tools to try out in the practice room. And I hope it cleared up some of the details about how you might implement this in your own practicing. So with that, happy counting, enjoy practicing, and see you in the next video.